Okay, how many of you got up Saturday morning to watch the royal wedding? Okay, all right. I involuntarily got up, uh, okay, I have to say. Um, I, I wasn't planning to, but around 4.30 in the morning I was up, and, um, and then I was like, okay, I'm up, okay, might as well look at it, and, 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 and my wife was up, I don't know when she was up, but uh, she's, she's, you know, she's part of the British Commonwealth as a um, former Jamaican citizen, so she had to, she had to honor the, the royal family, but uh, that was cool. I mean, I, some, how many saw you in recording? Uh, you know, l delayed broadcast. Okay, a few more. Oh, well, just the ladies, I know. You know, I was like, ah, uh, it's a wedding. What a, okay. Uh, <laughs> but, hey, um, today's topic is about current affairs and biblical prophecy. So, uh, we have something here that I thought we'd try out. We never, this is part of the, the app that we have. We never used as a congregation yet, but let's try this out. Is I want to try, invite you to go to this website, faithlife.com slash gc2sd he's going to do a live survey okay so everyone go to your phone and uh yeah it will, if you would like to do this please we'll just just for fun and like i said you don't have to register log in you just go to this website you look for our bulletin from may 20th and then maybe on the bottom of your screen it says go to the current slide so just go to the next next slide tommy okay um so do you see, see that, a survey on your screen? I'm curious to see uh, how often you guys either read or watch the news, whatever the day. So yeah, as you put it in, it's getting a live update. Isn't this cool? See, the number's going up and down. It's okay. So go. look at this. Okay, numbers are changing. Why is that? Some people cannot make up their minds. <laughs> All right, stop messing around with this, okay? <laughs> stop messing around with this. <laughs> okay. Okay, so a lot of us watch or read the news sometimes very often, okay? That's cool. Okay, now we'll go to the next survey, the next slide, and then um, this is about how important it is, okay? So one was like how often, and then it's like, this is, is it important to you or... Somewhat important or not important to you. All right. Okay. So again, pretty much a similar pattern here. Very important to somewhat important. All right. Yeah, you know, I, don't, I think we, we generally share the same attitude about wanting to know about current events. What's going on? And I'll tell you, I'm a, I'm a bit of a news junkie. You know, um, I, I like to read the news, watch the news, and it, it, it's, it's both a blessing and a curse, okay? First, it's a curse because I can just spend way too much time with that and go down this rabbit hole. Oh, you know, one news story goes to another, and like, oh, you just like, ah, anyone been there? Okay, yeah, just like, okay, stop it. This is taking up too much time. But, you know, at the same time, as you look at news, it's a curse because there's so much bad news right there, in there, right? Um, you know, most recent, this hor another horrific high school mass shooting, 10 people killed, you know, or, you know, what's, what's, the, what's North Korea going to do? Are they going to come and, you know, to the table or not? And is it threatening to back out of de denuclearization talks? Or, or other things like, uh, you know, a dad who killed his own kids and a um, woman who was ambushed. You know, I don't know. Sometimes you just kind of like, ah, I don't want to, you know, it's, it's too much, right? It's a curse to, to read all this, right? Um, but it can t also be a blessing. A famous theologian, in the 20th century theologian, said this, take your Bible and take your newspaper and read both. But interpret newspapers from your Bible. So he says, read your Bible, read newspaper, read both, but interpret what you read in the news. And I always remember that, uh, and that was taught to me like way back in seminary days. And you know, when you do that, actually something really profound and good can come out of it. Uh, for one thing, it really, as you read the scriptures and you understand what's happening in the news and vice versa, you understand, hey, the, what the Bible is saying 
is so true. Well, you know, for one thing, it confirms what the Bible says that all have sinned and we all fall short of the glory of God. Because, yeah, you look at all this stuff and go like, oh man, do we ever have a problem with sin in this, in this, you know, in this world? Um, if you question that, if you doubt the presence of sin, you know, just look at the news, right? All the murders, theft, sexual assaults, greed, violence, abortion, corruption, reality, you know, cruelty, um, even stupidity of some people, deception, prejudice, all that stuff. You just stop there and go, you know, it's so absurd to say that all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God, right? It also confirms that the Bible, you know, what the Bible says that we're all made in the image of God because. Thankfully, if you look hard enough, it's not all bad news. I mean, royal weddings, celebration of love and marriage and, and um, a Christian wedding broadcast around the world, that's good news. Or people helping evacuees you know, in Hawaii or back then in Puerto Rico or other places. People helping each other. Someone donating millions of dollars. Well, that's good. It reflects that there's, there's a hopeful note that it does reflect what the scripture said in Genesis 1, that God made human beings, you and me, in his image. And there's still a little faint glow of God's love and God's righteousness in that image he's put into us. So, there are some blessings there, right? Another blessing, or maybe another, another insight. As you read the scriptures and interpret the, the newspapers through the scriptures, and I don't know about you, but I feel this way, is you look at it and go, man, this world either needs salvation or judgment. Have you, have you ever thought that? Either it's like, Lord, please, Help, you know, save us or judge us. You know, sometimes we just kind of look at this world and go, you know, we understand. The problem is sin. The problem is our unrighteousness, our, um, our brokenness. And we know that the only thing that can change unrighteousness to righteousness and, you know, evil to good is Christ, right? And we can do good works as people, but ultimately, what creates goodness is a heart, what's in the heart. And the heart has to be changed. And the heart, if the heart is bent towards sin, we could do some good, but we'll also do so much more evil. I know that Jesus Christ, salvation in Christ, repentance, and turning our lives over to him, that's, I mean, that's the ultimate answer, right? For all the problems of the world. So I pray a lot of times, I, I pray, and I hope you do this too, is pray for the salvation of people, especially people in, in influence, people in leadership, people in politics, people in, in the global world that are influential. Pray for them. But, um, on the other hand, you know, you look at the things and people are, are just kind of, you see the direction of so many cultures, even our society, going against the Lord and, and just wanting to be more and more against the scriptures, they're saying, oh, maybe, you know, they're not going to turn to the Lord, then, then judgment. That's, that's what we need. Some of the Lord, I, you know, scriptures, uh, God in Revelation said, I am making all things new. And I go, yeah, Lord, please come quickly. Have you been there too? Have you gone like, oh, Lord, you know, Jesus just come back.
agate goes with king of three, and the large horn the king of eyes is the first two. The four horns that replace the one that was broken off represent the four kingdoms that will emerge from his nation who will not have the same power. Okay, so let's break this down. Um, it's around 530, 540 BC, around that time period. So just put that in your head. Daniel is in the Babylonian kingdom. That's the dominant kingdom. But the prophecy first then speaks of a media Persian kingdom. And in fact, uh, the Babylonian kingdom in about 339, 539, is going to be conquered by the Persians. So already there's a perception there is going to be another empire that's going to rise to root out the Medes and the Persians. crosses that strait of Istanbul there and starts attacking the Persian kingdom. And in four short years, he totally vanquishes the Persian Empire. All of you heard of Alexander the Great, right? You know, we all, we all know, you know, he just like conquered Turkey, the Middle East, even attacked Egypt, and went on to you know, where Iraq and Iran, all the way to India, in a matter of five or six years, he conquered this whole area. He was his flying goat. All right? He was, that's, that's, that's the representation. He was so swift. But when he was just 33 years old, he died of this mysterious illness. In 12 days, he was dead. He went from conqueror to a sick person and dead person in 12 days. So he died suddenly at the age of 33. And his kingdom, after a little civil war happened, five years later, was broken up into four empires, four kingdoms, led by four of his former generals. And guess what? God was speaking ahead hundreds of years. Remember, this was around 540 B.C., and we're talking about now 320 B.C. So over 200 years before, God was telling Daniel, this is what's going to happen. Daniel, this guy, this king is going to show up. Now as you know, it's Alexander the Great. His kingdom is going to be divided into four. And that's what happened in 320. You got divided into four. Now, it also says, as we go on, in, uh, in verse, or going back to verse 9, it says in verse 9 that out of one of those four horns came another horn which started small but grew in power to the south and to the east and towards the beautiful land. Well, when we look at history, we find out there's a guy, a king of one of the kingdoms that came out, Alexander the Great. His name is Antiochus IV. And he, he's the ruler of this Seleucid, it's called Seleucid Empire, and they, um, they have where Judea, Lebanon, Syria, um, and Jordan is right now in parts of southern Turkey. And what he did, tell me if this matches what he did, okay? Because it says he, um, okay, don't, don't show what he did yet, okay? Okay, just stay with verse 9. Yeah, thanks, cool. Okay, give away all the answers. Um, okay, he started small, but grew in power to the south and to the east and towards the beautiful land. So what did he do? In, in around um, 175 A.D. now, he says, you know, I am going to bring back the glory days of the Seleucid Empire because it had been in decline for like 120 years. He says, I am going to bring back its glory days. 
So to bring back boys, I am going to invade Egypt, steal all their money and their wealth, and yay! So he marches his army down towards Egypt. He gets soundly defeated. Okay, he just totally defeated. And then he decides that he's going to try again, and the Romans come along and say, "You do that, you know, and we're going to ally ourselves with Egypt, and you know, you're and you're going to be a goner." So he's he's like totally like boxed in. He's frustrated, and he's angry, and then the, the Jews in Judea are like, wow, this is a point of weakness for Titan. We're going to rebel. We're going to set up our own independence because we've been under the exclusive all this time. So he marches in to Jerusalem to suppress the Jewish rebellion. And guess what? That's what verse 9 says. And one of them came out and gave another horn, which started small but grew power to the south and to the east and towards the beautiful king. Israel. Now, the reason for the rebellion was because Antiochus wanted to make Judea Greek. Not, not return to UK. Real, all things Greek. See, Alexander the Great changed the cultural landscape of that area, area so that now everyone's talking Greek. Matter of fact, the New Testament was written in Greek because even though the Romans were in charge, Latin was not the preferable language. Greek was the preferable language. And of course, the Greeks were, you know, was the in thing. They, were, they had Aristotle, they had Plato, they had modern thinking, they had democracy and all this stuff. And, and art and beautiful temples and, and, and Antiochus wanted to make Judea and Jerusalem and Jewish people Greek. What do you think about that? What do you think the Jewish people responded with? They obviously did not like it. So there was this rebellion. And he came into Jerusalem. He stormed into there. He killed tons of people, destroyed most of the city, executed the rebel leaders, and then he prohibited the practice of the Jewish faith, the Jewish religion. And to make his point super clear, he took a pig, went to the temple, and sacrificed the pig on the temple altar. Now, if you know anything about Jewish faith, you know that's not kosher. Literally, okay? You know, that's, that is that's total sacrilege. And, and, and then to make his point even stronger, he erected a statue of Zeus, the Greek god Zeus, in the temple, in the Jerusalem temple. It's just like, no more Jewish religion, you are now going to worship the Greek gods. And guess what verse 10 says? Let me go back to that. It grew until it reached the host of heavens. It threw sound the starry host down to the earth and trampled on them. It set, itself, it set itself up to be as great as the commander of the army of the Lord. It took away the daily sacrifice from the Lord, and the sanctuary was thrown down. That's what Antiochus IV did. Again, this is hundreds, over 200 years, 300 years now, before all this happened. Verse 12, because of rebellion, be rebellion, the Lord's people and the daily sacrifice were given over to it. It prospered in everything it did, and truth was thrown to the ground. Here is the equally troubling thing. Not only did Antiochus do these horrible things, but he had the support of Jewish people. It was the people mainly in the cities that supported him, and the rural people, the backward people, wanted to keep their faith. But the people in Jerusalem and the leadership supported him. So there was a civil war going on, and Jews were supporting the killing of other Jews. And there were Jews who were saying, hey, we want to be like the Greeks. We want to be just like them. Enough of this old-time religion. Let's be progressive. So, so, not only was there rebellion, so the rebellion wasn't against Antiochus, so the rebellion was against the Lord. And verse 23, and talks about this rebellion, in the latter part of their re reign, when rebels had become completely wicked, a fierce-looking king, a king, a master of intrigue, will arise. See, the high priest, who's supposed to be the religious leader of, that, of, of their faith, well, people were buying that position. People were bribing Antiochus. I'll give you lots of money if you make me the high priest. And that's how there was. And the high priest was supporting his pagan 
religion. So <laughs> everything that the scripture is talking about was happening. Verse 24, he will become very strong, but not by his own power. He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy those who are mighty, the holy people. In his fleeing down to rebellion, he killed 40,000 Jewish people. Men, women, children, our ages. And then he enslaved another 40,000 Jewish people. And he destroyed most of Jerusalem, as I said. Verse 25. He will cause the seed to prosper, and he will consider himself superior. And Titus IV gave himself a, a nickname, a, a title of Epiphanus. Epiphanus. So it's now also, he's known as Antiochus Epiphanes. And Epiphanes is like epiphany. It, literally, it means God manifest. That's how he's describing himself. I am the manifestation of God. Now, that's, that's, uh, that's a little arrogant, don't you think? Yeah. But that's what scripture says. Um, he will consider himself superior. And when they feel secure, he will destroy many and take a stand against the prince of princes. Now, um, uh, the book of Maccabean uh, exp explains this. He made the possession of the Torah a cop capital offense. Okay? He burned copies of the Torah that he could find. He banned the celebration of Sabbaths and feasts. He outlawed circumcision. And any family that circumcised their baby were executed. That's how crazy it was getting. But in the verse 25 says, yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power. So, as he was putting down this rebellion in, in Jerusalem and Judea, the Persians, back over the east, decided, hey, this is a good time. He's really busy with the Jews. This is our time to rebel. So they opened up a rebellion. Because remember, the Seleucids, uh, they weren't very powerful. They're not like Rome. They're, they weren't that powerful empire. So, so while he's busy there, the Persians rebel, and he goes, okay, i got to take care of the Persians. So he leaves Judea, and as he's attempting to move against the Persians, he gets sick, and he dies. Just as scripture said again. Yeah, he will be destroyed, but not by human power. Even before he dies, the Maccabean, Maccabeans were um, be getting successful in the rebellion, so they were able to reinstate the sacrifice and reinstate the Jewish faith in 165 BC. Okay, a little history lesson there, okay? God, may I remember that? There was a quiz tomorrow on that. Okay, no, maybe not. Okay. Okay, but what does this all mean spiritually? What do we take, take away? See, we're reading. History of the newspaper, let's say we read the ancient history of all this happening, and we're reading the Bible now. Say, so how are we interpreting the, the current events of those times through the Bible, and what does it mean to us today? Well, let me give you some conclusions, takeaways here. First of all, God knows all things in detail. God, it just demonstrates that God knows all things in detail. I mean, down to which countries will rise and fall, what this king will do and not do, how he will die, on and on, even to the time frame, 2300 days and uh, uh, mornings and evenings. All these things, God knew in detail. He knows the details of today. He knows the details of tomorrow. He knows all the details. So as we're looking at what's going on in this world and both the good and the bad, and we're shocked, we're appalled, we're even caught by surprise, and we question, what in the world is God doing? What's going to happen tomorrow? Don't worry. Okay. God knows everything in all the complete details. He is all-knowing. He is omniscient. Say that word, omniscient. He's all-knowing, omniscient. Okay. But secondly, God's righteousness, the scriptures, the pro prophecies, promise and demonstrate will overcome evil. As horrible, murderous, powerful, anti-God as Antiochus IV was, and he seemed unstoppable, he could not escape God's righteousness. And God killed him with an illness. And everything he tried to do ultimately failed. The Maccabeans, as I said, re restored uh, the Jewish faith to the Jewish people, 
and they ultimately became in the, an independent country until Rome took over in 63 BC. Most significantly, significantly, the temple of God that he desecrated was reconsecrated and the faithful were restored. And that's why we have Hanukkah today. The, the Jewish festival of Hanukkah is the celebration of the restoration of the temple. And it was a miracle that happened was they, they wanted to uh, relight um, the lanterns, but they thought they only had seven days, or oh, one day's worth of uh, olive oil to burn the lantern, but it ended up with seven days. So that's, uh, that's Hanukkah. But the third thing we can learn from this is that history will repeat itself. History will repeat itself. Now, I told you that all this happened, you know, the Greeks and Persians and everything, and that was something of history. But when we read carefully the text again, in verse 17 and verse 19, it tells us that there's more than just history here. Back to verse 17, uh, the man who explains says, he came near the place where I was standing, I was terrified and fell prostrate. Son of man, he said to me, understand that the vision concerns the time of the end. The time of the end. In verse 19, he said, I'm going to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath because the vision concerns the appointed time of the end. He's not just talking about a guy named Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus IV. He's talking about something that's going to be happening in the end times. He's going to be talking about the time before Judgment Day arrives. So even though Antiochus IV or Epiphanes matched the description of this last king, these verses indicate that the ultimate fulfillment of this prophecy is still in the future. And Antiochus was just a type. He was just a, a history lesson that God gave us to say, yes, you saw this guy, what he did? There's going to be a guy that's going to come, come up at the end times that's going to be just like him and actually worse than him and be even more evil. And we know him as the Antichrist. So Antiochus was really just a type, a prototype of the Antichrist. And so history is going to repeat itself. And not only Antiochus has attacked the, the Jewish people in Judea, the Antichrist is going to attack the Jewish people and Christians and anyone who wants to follow the God of the Bible all over the world. And when we look at this and saw that the Jewish people who had supported his, his revamping of Jewish culture and make it Hellenistic, we're already seeing that kind of rebellion in our world now where we say, hey, let's do away with this old school Bible stuff. That's out of date. Let's be more modern. Let's have a new morality, a new faith, a new spirituality that's not tied in with these staidly old and you know, uh, restrictive commandments of Scripture. So that's what's happening already. History is repeating itself. And unfortunately, just as the Jewish people who follow Antiochus were all for supporting his repression and his killing of their fellow Jews who were trying, trying to be faithful to the scripture, we're going to look for, we have, there'll be a day when those who say they're Christians or Jews or faithful religious people are going to say, I, I totally support the persecution, the, you know, the jailing or whatever that's going to happen. Well, people are trying to follow the Bible because, you know, they are resisting progress. But, History is also going to repeat itself because it's Scripture's promise that at the end, none of this evil will prevail. Only Christ, his church, his kingdom will be victorious. And say, so how do we know that? How can we be sure that all the stuff we see isn't just going to get worse and worse and it's just going to end all really badly? Again, you look at history. Look at what happened with, with Antiochus IV. Look what happened 
with the Maccabeans coming back and restoring. Look at what happened to the Romans who tried again, who did destroy the temple, destroy Israel. And look where Israel is and where the Romans are. Ah, now you look at history and go, we can be sure that ultimately as evil rises, God's righteousness, God's goodness will prevail. And that's our hope. That is our assurance. As the rest of the world may go, oh, this thing is just awful, bad. We have hope. Yes, it is bad, but don't worry. That's not where the story ends. So don't be discouraged. It's one of the things I want to end with. Here. Don't be in- discouraged by all the bad news you read and all the current events. But read those news, understand them in light where God is taking this world ultimately. Then I want to share with you 2 Peter 3, 14, 15, because it has a very practical application for you and me or anyone who walks with Christ or don't walk with Christ, actually. Verse 3, uh, 14 says, So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, he's talking about Christ's return, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. The first personal response is that make sure that you are in the right relationship with Christ. Because on that day he returns, it's judgment. And, not, and those who do not have Christ as their Savior be judged by their work. Or those who have Christ as their Savior be judged by what Christ did. But our works, we ourselves, our works will be judged. And we will be rewarded according to whether we have how faithful and how fruitful we have in our lives. So the challenge is for you yourself to work on your relationship with Christ. Be faithful. Be spotless and blameless and at peace with him. But, and also, then verse 15 says, Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. Just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. And what does that mean? God, so many times, say, why is God allowing evil to happen? Why did he just end it? And the answer is, he's giving people time to turn to Christ to be saved. Mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. So he's delaying his return is giving people the opportunity to turn to Christ and to be saved. And it's giving us who are believers, who are already are saved, the opportunity to share that faith, to share the gospel, share the good news that they do not need to fear evil. They do not need to fear the future or eternity. Because Jesus Christ came to die for their sins and to be saved through faith, not their works. And they do not need to fear God, but they need to love him and obey him through faith in Jesus Christ. That's our job. That's our journey. That's our mission for Christ's followers. So, do not doubt. Don't be afraid. Don't worry. Get right with the Lord. Walk with him. And if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then I invite you to do that today because you don't know when Christ is coming back. And then it'll be too late. Today is the day of salvation when you can put your trust in him. Say, I am a sinner. I, need, I, am, I don't need to point the finger at anyone else. I know who I am. And I need forgiveness. And I need redemption. Lord, forgive me and invite, I invite Jesus Christ to be my Savior, my Lord. That's the doorway to salvation. And those who have made that decision are walking with Christ. We've got a rescue mission. We've got a mission to rescue people before it's too late. Keep your eye on, on 
daily events, and just keep on seeing what God is doing. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you give us passages like in Daniel and other prophetic scripture to show us your power, your knowledge, your understanding, your wisdom, 